Welcome to the Teamwork Advantage podcast with Greg Gregory. Join us as Greg interviews powerful thought leaders and successful team and leadership experts from across the country on teamwork, leadership, and organizational culture. Now let's check in for this week's episode. Welcome back to the Teamwork Advantage, a podcast focusing in on teamwork, leadership, and culture. Of course, that means all that goes into each one of those as well. Every week on the Teamwork Advantage, we offer you impactful ideas that you can use immediately, whether you're a frontline employee all the way through the executive suite in your organization. It also will work with church groups, volunteer groups, organizations. Wherever you put together a team, these concepts are very, very applicable. Joining us today from the Arizona area is uh, Rick DeBrule. Now, Rick's been around for quite a while uh, doing a whole lot of things. And it's, uh, I guess you could say sometimes you might say it's a, uh, a master of everything. He's going to been into so many different areas of what he does. And that's kind of exciting. And he totally understands communications. As an award-winning network television broadcaster with a master's degree in media management, he is a, has the insight to help any business innovate and grow by improving the way their people communicate. Rick spent over 31 years at the NBC affiliate station in Phoenix as an anchor as well as a reporter. That tenure included managing the station's consumer advocacy team. He found that often the customer's problems were the result of poor communications from the company. And I would probably venture possibly also from the other side and they met in the middle. Adding to his diverse background, Rick spent more than 30 years covering racing for the uh, networks of ESPN, ABC, NBC, and Fox. In a world that travels more than 200 miles an hour, he's learned that communication is critical. The right information at the right time not only gives teams a chance to win, it also can avoid a disaster and put lives are at risk. Rick has also managed communication team for statewide organizations, everything from corporate branding to crisis communications. And don't we know right now, in the midst of a pandemic, we are having crisis. He understands both, and this is an interesting one, social as well as traditional media outlets. His goal today is to help people and organizations find their voice, tell their story, whether it's an employee, an investor, consumer communication, improving both the message and delivery. Wow. It can help achieve its potential. As a sidebar note, he's also the voice of Barrett Jackson Auctions, the world's greatest collector car auctions. You can hear him on A&E and the History Channel doing those a few times a year. Welcome, Rick DeBrule. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Boy, when you read all that, I'm like, have I done all that lately? That's, <laughs> that's a lot of stuff. Well, that's 31 years. <laughs> Start adding all that in, it gets a little bit crazy, doesn't it? Exactly, exactly. So I'd like to get everybody up to speed. Before we jump into the meat of everything that we're going to touch on today, tell us a little bit how you kind of got started uh, as far as getting into the media world itself. Because media is a great communication tool. And I remember something that a media person said, oh, gosh, I guess when I was a child, I think it was Dan Rather who said, the camera never blinks. Yeah, that was the the title of Can Dan's first autobiography, which, by the way, is a, a great book. He he was at almost every significant event of the fifties and sixties and seventies, and so he he has some great stories in there. Yeah. You know, I I'll be honest with you, I I'm just one of those kids who, when I grew up, I was a storyteller. You know, I like to tell stories. Mm -hmm. When I went to college, I ended up being a journalism major where I got to tell stories. And then I got into the TV world and became a news reporter and news anchor. And once again, stories are what it's all about. So I just enjoy the concept of telling stories and communication, the way it works in that way. Um, and in fact, I, I have a motto, which is uh, it, it's words motivate people, but stories inspire them because I think it's really true. You know, words only go so far, but when you tell people a story, boy, that takes it to the next level and they really understand. So that's what I was fortunate during my TV news career to be able to do that. And then even in my racing world, you know, one of the things we were really big on when I was part of the ABC broadcast team for the 8500 was telling the stories of the drivers and the team so that the people at home could really relate to what was going on. That is so true. Uh, being able to paint a visual picture, even though they can see something happening, being able to paint the picture of what's going on behind the scenes of the scene. Absolutely. Absolutely. Critical. 
It, it, it's just what allows people to go from just seeing words or hearing words to feeling that connection. I mean, you think about it, that's what happens in movies all the time. There's a reason mm -hmm. people cry at the end of movies. It's because that story has connected with them. Well, even as much as a commercial, I still remember, what was it, the 1979 Super Bowl commercial with Mean Joe Green and Coke. You one know, of the great ones. It's, it's a great one. It absolutely is. And it's, it's how they communicate, how they weave a story of that caliber into 30 seconds. And, and, and that's really important to remember because people get really caught up in, you know, I, I, I do communication coaching and presentation coaching and, you know, and people will say, well, I, I really can't condense what I do down into a minute or 30 seconds. And I'm like, yes, you can. If they can take a TV commercial and literally make people cry at the end of 30 seconds or a minute, then you can tell the basic of your story in 30 seconds or a minute, or maybe you even get two, but you can do it. You just mm -hmm. have to figure out what the core is and what is the story that you want to tell? What's the message you want to get across? And what I tell people to do is condense it down as much as you possibly can. We, we, I have this line. So we, we just uh, published a book called The Insider's Guide to Media Training. It's one of the two books I've got out. Mm -hmm. And in The Insider's Guide to Media Training that came out this year, we've got a thing which is WWYHB, which stands for What Would Your Headline Be? What I want people to do is condense down their message to maybe five, seven words, sometimes three words. You think about it, man bites dog, Pope elopes, you know, whatever it may be, how could you condense the, your message down to a headline? And once you get it down to the core, then you start figuring out how to expand. Most people start off right off the bat trying to put 20 pounds of sugar into a one pound bag. Mm -hmm. And I used to joke, that was my job when I was in TV news. I would spend the entire day researching a story and then at night, I, when the newscast aired, I had one minute and 15 seconds to put all the information that I had learned that day into the story. And, and I, what I joke is the first thing you have to do with that 20 pounds of sugar in one pound bag is you need to scrape off 19 pounds of sugar. If you try to cram too much information into your two minute presentation, your five minute presentation, the phone call, whatever it may be, all you do is end up confusing people and, and you lose track of what you're trying to say. When you get it down to what would your headline be, mm -hmm. those five to seven words, your basic message, it's so easy then to start building out now that you've made it short to make it 30 seconds, a minute, two minutes, five minutes, an hour. It's easier it to grow than to shrink. It is much easier to grow than to shrink. And too many people, when they do presentations, they're, they're already in trouble. They mm -hmm. didn't time it out ahead of time, and they're trying to put 20 minutes into a five-minute presentation. Yeah. Before I got into speaking and training myself, I was in the mortgage world, and I would go into real estate offices to do training sessions on finance. And they would tell me I had 20 minutes. Well, right before I go on, they say, sorry, we're tight on time. Can you do it in 10? <laughs> <laughs> so I always had a five-minute version, a 10-minute version, and a 20-minute version to go. Yeah, exactly. And and. You know, it's nice when you can expand it out, but, but what you don't want to do is you don't want to be that guy who's up there with a PowerPoint and going, well, I don't have time for this slide. I don't have time for this slide. And, and let me just jump to the end because then the audience is thinking, well, what, what am I, I missing? Just exactly. Yeah. You, you want to, first off, you want to be able to breathe and relax. People speak better when they're relaxed mm -hmm. and you want to be able to get the key points in. And if you're trying to put too many in, you just get lost. Oh, Absolutely. Absolutely. So let's talk a little bit about communication in general. In dyad communication or in team communication, leadership, someone think that what's the common mistake? What's some of the biggest mistakes people make? I, I tell you what, the key mistake, the, the one that happens all the time is people assume that when they say something, they've communicated. And it's important to understand that communication is a circular process, right? I say something, you hear it, you respond, I hear it, I can't respond back. <clears throat> just, the, just, just the other day, my wife asked me to do something. I went off for the rest of the day. And at the end of the day, you know, my wife said, well, how come you didn't do that? And I'm like, well, I didn't hear you say that. And you know, it was one of those lost moments where she said it, assumed I heard it, I didn't hear it. So there was no circular communication. Yeah. People too often assume that, that when I've said something that you've heard it. And you know, there's research that shows that most commonly when there is a failure in communication, it's on the part of the sender, the transmitter of the information. Interesting. Which means if you're giving the information, you need to be careful to make sure. But, but here's where it gets more complicated. If you're the person receiving the information, you need to assume that the sender isn't doing it right. 
that he said something that they, they, they may have not included all the right tidbits. And that's where you have to get into active listening where you say, okay, well, I, I know you said this, but is this what you feel like lying? You know, you, you said jump off a cliff. Did you really want me to jump off an actual cliff or was this metaphorical? So it becomes that, all right, what, what is it you're, you're actually trying to say? So the, the, the job of the listener is to assume that, okay, I'm not getting all the information. So I have to make sure I ask questions on the back end and that we clarify and we make sure that we do it a little more actively as opposed to passively. Because once again, right. too many people just assume, oh, I said something, I communicated or the communication's working when in fact the people around them may not feel that way at all. Right. And then there's the other side of people who hear things and they get about every third word because <laughs> they're not actively listening. And then there's also, I think the term is reflective listening, is feeding back what you heard, making yeah. sure that you're on the same page. Is that part of active listening? Yeah, absolutely. You know, active listening really boils down to where you listen. You, you, and, and, and the difficult thing for people, and we all have this problem, is when we're listening, we're thinking about what are we going to add to the conversation? What am I, what's my next question going to be? Um, it, as opposed to really listening and taking in. Mm -hmm. what you, what you, so you need to listen. You need to, to actually understand. Then you need to cl uh, clarify. You need to say, is this what you meant? And then you ask those follow-up questions. And I always point out, you know, as a reporter, I made my living on the questions of who, what, when, where, why, and how. How many times when you leave a conversation, if you were to sit back and go, do I know the answer to who, what, when, where, why, and how? You'd be amazed how many times you're like, you know, I didn't ask when, or I didn't ask what, or I didn't ask why. And, and you know, there, now there's times when, you know, it's an ongoing project. Maybe you don't need every single one of those. Mm -hmm. But oftentimes, if you, if you, after the conversation is over, go through those six questions in your mind. And if you don't have an answer for all six of them, it's probably because, once again, this communication being cyclic, circular, circular, mm -hmm. you didn't, you, you know, you may not have heard it. They may not have communicated it. You assume something, and let's face it, we all know what, how probably uh, problem absolutely. that is. <clears throat> and then you go off and you go, well, wait a minute. Is that what I heard? Or did I hear this? Or you go off and assume that something happened. So it's that ability to ask those questions and make sure you clarify. That's a big thing. I always point out that, you know, it's like, it's like you know, wiping the window. You know, you want to wipe the window, make sure that what you've heard is really what was said and what was yeah. intended. Yeah, and that's that's absolutely critical through that. You mentioned, and we talked about it in your bio and in your introduction there, that as a consumer advocate, that some of the, we were talking about as, as a consumer advocate reporter, that sometimes the communication problem is on the business side or where. Can you expand on that a little bit? Sure. I, I was really fortunate. I ran a, a consumer advocacy team for a TV station for about nine years. Um, people would call up our consumer advocates. I had a team of 30 volunteers who did this. It was an amazing group of people. And they would say, you know, I'm having a problem with this car dealer. Or I'm having a problem with my cable company or my bank or whatever it is. And inevitably, the vast majority of the time when we began to research it, what we found was there was just a failure of communication between the company and the consumer. Now, don't get me wrong, the consumer sometimes could be just as much of a problem. They didn't ask those clarifying questions. They didn't read the contract, whatever it may be. Um, we, we found that oftentimes the consumer was just as much as fault as the company. But if the company had reached out and communicated and clarified things, rather than just say, oh, it's in a contract, then you wouldn't have had a consumer calling a TV station trying to get a problem resolved. I mean, that's the last thing you want to do if you're running a business. Right. You want that, that consumer to like having to deal with you. And so as a result, you know, the, the thing we learned over and over again was it was just that lack of communication on the front end. And sometimes it's because, you know, a company does the things a thousand times. But a consumer, sometimes when they're dealing with a company, may only do it once or twice. In a lifetime, you know, Absolutely you have to make sure that, that you're, with the way you're communicating, that you're trying mm -hmm. to figure out those questions in advance. I was just working yeah. with a company this morning on their website and, and I went through and the first thing I, I looked at it as part of the communication was, well, well, what if I don't understand that? And they were like, well, doesn't everybody? I'm like, I don't understand that. Why would everybody understand that? So we had to revamp that portion of the website. Yeah, and that could be as simple as putting in a little thought bubble that pops up when you mouse over something. Exactly. Just yeah. un thinking about it from a different perspective. And oftentimes we forget to do that in business. Yeah. Um, it's, it goes back to the other analogy. A lot of times I talk to this. In McDonald's or any fast food restaurant, 
When do they make more of their mistakes? When they're busy or when they're slow? And they make more mistakes when they're slow. Absolutely. Because now they're, they're having to think and they don't always think. And when they're busy, they're going from muscle memory. You know, in the racing world, you know, I, I covered the Indy 500 for a long time. And, and, you know, the cars are traveling at 225 miles an hour. And sometimes, you know, driver, they, they might tell a driver for a variety of reasons to slow down. And the drivers will generally say, no, I want to keep going at full speed because I'm in that rhythm of doing it the right way. When I slow down, suddenly the rhythm change. I begin to think about well, what's my next pit stop going to be. So drivers, a lot of time, would rather be at full speed than slowing down because mm -hmm. of that exact problem. Now, in the Indy races, we talk a lot in teamwork about how important the pit crews are, whether it's NASCAR or Indy or any other car. Those, those communication in the pit crew and the team and the bosses, the people upstairs, talk to me a little bit about that. And if you got, I think you've got a great story uh, about something there about communication. Yeah, I mean, you know, as I mentioned, I was part of the uh, the ESPN Indy 500 team for a number of years covering the Indy 500 as along with IndyCar racing. Um, and, and I have a great story that I love to tell as a keynote presentation. Um, and it's about the 2016 Indy 500 and a driver by the name of Alexander Rossi. He was a rookie that year, it was the 100th running of the race. And I'll just give you a little bit of the story. It, it's, a, it's a fun, great story to hear and to tell. But, you know, that day they had a whole bunch of problems during the first half of the race. And he found himself literally in last place on the track. And, you know, everybody starts the race the same way, right? They want to go fast, have short pit stops and then win the race. And inevitably, most drivers who win the Indy 500 have some problem that crops up. So it becomes how do you deal with that problem? And that day. Alexander Rossi's team responded amazingly. And as I point out, Alexander Rossi didn't win the race that day as a rookie because he was the fastest or most experienced. He was fast, but he won that day because his team communicated better than everyone else. When they began to have problems, first off, they had pit stop problems. So the crew within their pit had to communicate how to solve that. Then when they came, had to come up with a new strategy for Alexander to win on the racetrack itself, they had to communicate as quickly as possible. Now, one of my big themes is, you know, I th think it's important that we all communicate at the right speed. Right. And, and that doesn't mean going fast, right? Now, when your driver is going 225 miles an hour at the Indy 500, well, of course, you have to communicate fast. And that's what they did that day. But I also point out that there's other times when you have to slow things down. Just because we can go fast doesn't mean we always should. Exactly. But you know, I, one of the things I talked about with the team owner, a guy named Brian Herta, who was the team owner for Alexander Rossi that day, I talked to him about all the communication they did and how well they did it. And once again, how the communication won them the race. And I'll tell you what, the last lap of that race is an exciting story to hear. But, but Brian Herta told me, he said, you know, the key for us winning the race that day was the fact that built within our organization was what he called a culture of communication. And what he means by that is people were able to bring ideas forward. They were able to say crazy ideas, which is what helped them win the race that day and feel they were going to be heard. And one of the things he points out is that that communication culture can't start the day of the race, can't start the week of the race, or even the month of the race. It has to be built into the organization. If it's not built into the organization, let's face it, you have a crisis today, you can't go, well, well that's the first thing we're gonna do. We have a meeting about how we're going to start communicating in this organization. If you had that culture of communication, when the crisis hits, boy, you're ready to go. You can start firing on all cylinders. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have that culture of communication, if, if you have misunderstandings, and, and let's face it, I, I always tell people communication is really hard. You know, it's like baseball. You know, if a, if a baseball player is batting 300, we consider him a great baseball player, right? That means Honestly, he's still failing 70% of the time. Exactly. And communication is probably the same way. I think we are failing 70% of the time. That doesn't mean we don't want to try for 300, 350, 400. But you have to understand that you're going to make mistakes. And it becomes, okay, how do you make up for that? And once again, if you've got a good culture of communication within your organization, then you have the foundation that's been built right off the bat. You know, one of the, the, the statistics I saw came out of a survey a couple of years ago. It was a Facebook working survey. They talked about the fact that 90% of senior leaders said that they have an open door policy that employees can come in, bring ideas forward and, and be listened to and, and, have, and feel like they, that idea was acted upon. But 
45% of the employees felt their managers had an open door policy. So what does that disconnect? The managers think, oh, they can come in anytime. My employees know they can come in anytime. And the employees are saying, no, I can't. Last time I came in, he shot me down. Or last time I came in, he said I was a goofball or whatever it may be. Now, just because an employee comes in with an idea doesn't mean it's going to happen. But that you, you want that employee to know that A, they can bring it forward. B, it's going to be listened to. And it may not go forward, but at least it was listened to. Right. But that's that problem, that disconnect between, you know, is it a communication culture? It's not a communication culture if the manager thinks he, people can talk to them, but the employees don't think they can. Right. And that goes back to a, an expression uh, an old friend of mine used to use. There has to be consistency between word and deed. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, Aristotle laid it out a long time ago. He talked about the three forms of persuasion, right? There's pathos, logos, and ethos. Uh, logos is, of course, the logical argument. That's where I can try to convince you to do something. I persuade you to do something based on the facts. Pathos is that emotional appeal. I want you to do something because we're friends or because I show you a picture of a puppy dog and I appeal to your heart. And then the ethos is the ethical appeal you know, based on trust. And as I often point out, it doesn't matter how good your facts are. It doesn't matter how good your emotional appeal is. If people don't trust you, they're not going to listen to your argument. If they don't trust you, they won't believe your facts and they won't believe your emotional appeal is legitimate. So of those three things that Aristotle pointed out thousands of years ago, ethos, pathos, and logos, ethos stands tallest. And it doesn't mean that, you, that we're always gonna do it right. I mean, every now and then you're going to make a mistake, but you have to rebuild that trust so communication can move forward. You know, the trust is so key. And I talk about that, we've had several guests on the, teamwork advantage, go into the level of trust and vulnerability trust. And we have to get that level. And that's, that's so critical to every success. So I have a program, I call it LEAF, L-E-A-F. It's four-step process to restore trust because trust will break down. And sometimes it breaks down because of something we actually did. Sometimes it's the trust that's broken down because of maybe something that was perceived in the way we did it, the way it was communicated. Mm -hmm. And LEAF, L-E-A-F, is a four-step process. The first step is listen. Let's go back to those managers who need to listen to their employees. People want to be listened to. Mm -hmm. The second, second step, the E, is empathy, to empathize. It's not enough just to listen. You have to feel, the, the, the employee has to feel, the people you're communicating have to feel that you actually can understand and empathize. And understand there's a huge difference between empathy and sympathy. Huge. Sympathy, sympathy creates distance between you and the other person. Empathy closes the distance between you and the other person. So you have listen, empathy. A stands for acknowledge. And that's where at some point you have to acknowledge why the trust broke down. It doesn't mean you have to completely accept blame for it, but you have to acknowledge, you know what? There was a problem. Somebody said something, maybe it was somebody within the organization, it might not have been you. And you have to acknowledge that there's a reason why this person, this employee, whoever it may be, feels the way they do. And, and that once could that have been... It could have been um, factual or non-factual. I mean, today's oh, world of social media. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. these days, I mean, I, I knew of a, of a circumstance between two employees where basically one disliked the other one intensely because of something they perceived happened, which this person never knew that it was being perceived that way. And it was a huge problem between these two employees. And yet all it was, was a miscommunication. So you have to acknowledge the fact that, you know what, it may have been a miscommunication, but it still happened and it still existed. So it's L, E, A, and F, I always argue, is the most critical, the follow through. That's where you have to say, okay, <clears throat> we understand, I listen to you. <clears throat> I empathize with your situation. I acknowledge that it happened. Now here's what we're going to do to fix it moving forward. And you have to follow through. If you say we're going to do this and you don't, then all you've done is break down the same trust problem, <clears throat> excuse me, and made it even worse. Yeah. But if you follow through, you can begin to build. And th there's a lot of research that shows people are willing to forgive. They really are. They will forgive you, but only if they feel they're being listened to and they feel that people are following through with what's being said. I mean, forgiveness in today's world, I think, has become incredible. And if we don't have that level of trust, then we're going to perceive the other person as more egotistical than anything else. Right. And we're not going to we're, we're get there. And that ability to empathize, you know, I mean, let's face it, none of us are perfect. 
you know, oh. if I can't empathize with the fact that you're not perfect because I'm not perfect, I, I think we have a problem. Yeah. But I think, you know, we, we, we both have areas for improvement. And mm -hmm. I mean that for you, Greg, and me, Rick. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. We just have to understand where that, where that falls. Mm -hmm. We have to be able to acknowledge our faults. There's no doubt. Yeah, exactly. So in today's world, while we may be nearing, and I use the word cautiously here, nearing the end of a pandemic and people working remotely and from all indications that I'm reading and seeing around the world, we're going to basically be in a virtual remote working mindset for a time to come. At least, I don't think we're ever going to go back to full throttle in office. What is COVID done to our communication because we're now working remotely? So I actually did a survey about this with uh, both, it was both employees and managers just a few months ago. And I asked them about, you know, how is COVID? And of course I expected everybody to say, oh, communication is horrible. And, and I was shocked to find out that actually people felt the communication within their work groups was 50% of those who responded said it was at least as good as it was before the pandemic. And another 28% said it was better. And you think about it, and, and I've talked to a number of people and to, to understand this a little bit better. It's because, you know, we, we face this crisis and we all figured out, okay, we have to do a better job of what we're doing. So, so they began to communicate better. I, I know one particular group that, you know, that they were doing their thing in their office on a regular basis and they sort of communicated a little bit. But they started having these, these you know, five minute Zoom meetings every morning where every day they touch base. I'm doing this, I'm doing this, I'm doing this. And within their team, they were communicating so well. So it was great. But here's what that survey also showed. And interestingly enough, it's not a question we asked. It's a question that we began to see percolate up through the comments, which was people said that while communication within their own small group was at least as good, if not better than it was before, the communication within the organization to the next level out, to the next level out beyond that was out. worse. Because while that small group was communicating so well, no longer were you seeing somebody in the hallway. No longer were you, you know, meeting somebody in the lunchroom. No longer did you go to a meeting where there were you know, an extra 20 people in the meeting and you casually saw, oh, there's Bob. I probably ought to tell him about this. Or there's so-and-so. I need to remember that. There's an idea. I can mention it with that person. That next level out of communication. So we, what we have to do is be more intentional about how we not just communicate with our individual work groups, but with those at the next level out, how we need to include them in and we need to do it intentionally. Because I mean, I always point out, you know, you can't innovate unless you communicate and you can't communicate unless you're doing it intentionally with all the people that need to be a part of that process. Right. What's happening is you're right. And a lot of people are feeling that they are communicating better within their immediate team, but that is actually building up stronger silos in organizations. You know, we've talked about that for years, you know, breaking down the silos. And I think one of the difficulties is it, within the pandemic, we've worked so hard to improve the communication within each silo, but the silos are getting taller. And so we need to figure out how we're, and, and you know, when the pre-pandemic days were here, it was kind of easy. You know, we could, we could, you know, let's, ha let's have a retreat one day or let's have a, a group lunch or whatever. And so you'd bring everybody into a room and you do a team building exercise. You could have some fun. Well, well now you can't do that. And so it becomes, how can you do those same things? You know, there was just an article on Forbes the other day, the Harvard Business Review, pardon me, that talked about the importance of small talk during Zoom meetings. You know, people want to get in, do their thing and get out. And, and, you know, people get annoyed by the concept of, oh, now they're talking about Susie's pregnant and Tom's had this issue or somebody got a new dog and it's like so annoying. But, you know, those are those little things that actually create uh, bonding moments within teams yeah. and, it, and, and you do it within your own, your small team, then you have to figure out how to do it to that next level out as well. Yeah. It's, it's fascinating to really recognize that because there's certain styles of personalities, behaviors, whatever you want to call it, that are very task driven and not necessarily socially driven. So if you would walk into, you know, Susie's office and, hey, how was your weekend? What's going on? And Susie's not one of those types. She's going to shut you down quicker than anything. And you're going to think, well, she's rude. She's not. But we've got to recognize that of where it fits. And on a team, you need to kind of balance that off. You need to go a little bit one way, a little bit the other way. And how do you recommend in today's COVID environment and pandemic, remote working, how do you recommend that people do that? 
let's go back to the most basic core that we started off talking about. You know, that's that ability to actively listen. If people mm-hmm. believe they're being listened to, they're more willing to trust you. They're more willing to feel that you're at least working with them as opposed to working on your own. And, and, and let's face it, you know, during the pandemic, when we're all in our own home offices and we're all just having Zoom meetings, it is more difficult to communicate. Mm-hmm. So it becomes, all right, how, what, what are the little things I can potentially do? Maybe it's just sending an email. Maybe it's just sending a text message. You know, I often point out, whenever I do presentations, one of the last things I leave people with is the fact that you're only as good as your last communication. And what I challenge people is, is that when they leave that room, they need to communicate with somebody. Who's it going to be? Because you think about it, we almost all owe somebody a, an email, a text message, a, a voice, phone call, whatever it may be. Maybe we don't want to talk to that guy. Maybe it's somebody we just don't have all the right answers for. There was a research project that showed that, that they call it knowledge workers, basically white collar workers, spend three and a half hours every week waiting for somebody to respond to them. We're waiting for somebody to get back mm-hmm. to us because, well, I can't move forward until I know what's happening. But sometimes, let's face it, we don't, we don't know how to move forward. You know, I don't have all the information. But if I at least call Greg up and say, hey, Greg, you know, I, I know I was hoping to get you some information by today. I don't have it. I may be able to get it by tomorrow. But, you know, based on this set, fact, set of facts, we may not get it until next week. Well, right. that gives Greg the ability to say, okay, I can either wait till tomorrow or if it's going to be next week, maybe I need to come up with a plan B and maybe we need to brainstorm that. Mm-hmm. You know, it's that ability to say, okay, have I communicated? And, and, and we all have somebody that we owe an answer to, Right. We, it, maybe it's because we don't like that guy. We don't want to answer it. We're, we're, maybe it's, it's because un- we just forgot. Yeah, it's uncomfortable. Try, you, and sometimes we forget. And then because we forgot, we're afraid to call him back because, well, I should have called him back last week. And we make it even worse. You know, we just need to reach out. And, and, and once again, I'm not asking people to reinvent everything they do. I just say do one communication today. Text message voicemail, Slack, team, whatever it may be, get mm-hmm. that message out there and reach out to some, and you know how much better it feels when you get that monkey off your back? You know, that communication monkey that was sitting there going, you haven't called Bob, you haven't called Greg, how come, when are you gonna do that? And suddenly you just call him up and say, look, I, you, know, you know what, I can't do that. Or I don't have the information for you. Or corporate said, we're not gonna do that and here's why. Whatever it may be, even though it's uncomfortable, uncomfortable, you feel so much better when it's over and you move on. Yeah, it's, it's the anticipation of having to make it that is more uncomfortable than actually making the communication. I, I, how many times is that true? The dread of making the phone call, the dread. And some people will just send, you know, it's like the old joke about people now who break up by text message. I mean, there's nothing br- more brutal than breaking up in a relationship with text message, but okay, at least it happened. At least you let the person know and you didn't leave them hanging. You know, in a perfect world, it'd nice, be nice to at least make a phone call, but yeah. something, communicate. Yeah. Oh, by the way, just as a little sidebar here, um, years ago in the mortgage industry, I got fired in voicemail. <laughs> well, I, once again, at least they told you. They didn't leave you hanging. They didn't, you know, not like office space where you came in and you know, suddenly your stuff was, was going to your desk. Yeah. It's interesting. So you're, you've got... You've got your book, and you, you, I think you talked about one earlier, but you've also got Communicating at the Right Speed. Yeah, so I've got two books. Uh, once again, the most recent is the Insider's Guide to Media Training, which is uh, one I wrote with a, a old college friend of mine about media training and the importance of communicating there. And, and that's actually good for even people who are just getting job interviews. It's really great to help you synthesize. But th- my first book was called Communicating at the Right Speed. And, and it really takes a lot of these corporate lessons. And, and it's a very simple, quick and easy read because I'm a TV guy. I, I don't write long and complex. And it's really almost a workbook. And each set of pages, there's an essay and and there's a set of questions. And it's a simple set of questions that say, okay, here's the essay. And, and, and here's an example. Uh, are you an elephant or a hippopotamus? And you think about it, an elephant has great big ears and a tiny mouth. The hippopotamus has little tiny ears and a great big mouth. When you're in the meeting, are you the elephant or are you the hippopotamus? And so like, that's a concept. You might that- went in a different direction. <laughs> my, my elephant remembers everything. <laughs> uh, well, we, we think they do, but, but visually, you know, you can see their ears. Mm-hmm. So one of the, the questions, the set of questions, it becomes, okay, for the next week when you're in your meetings, 
be the elephant, be the person with the big ears, not the person who's, who's dominating the conversation. So communicating at the right speed is really all about learning how to communicate within meetings, within teams, and to do it effectively and efficiently. You know, when we talked about crisis communication a little bit earlier, and, and crisis communication is a really interesting area. First off, the word crisis, the root word of crisis doesn't mean problem. It means turning point. Crisis is that point in the original definition was actually that, that point in a disease when something begins to get better or get worse. So if you think of a crisis as a turning point, then it becomes, okay, it's not a problem. It's how do I get past it to improve or get worse? And communicating during that crisis is absolutely critical. Just because you solve the problem, you need to make sure those around you do. But going back to communicating at the right speed, I always tell people there's times when you have to slow things down. Just because we can answer an email immediately, a Slack message, team message, a group text, whatever it may be, doesn't mean you have to say it right now. Sometimes you want to step back and go, you know what? I need to do an hour's worth of research on this and I'll get back to you. But the problem is because we can do, communicate so fast, now we treat everything the same way, meaning we communicate quickly when we shouldn't, but when we need to communicate even faster, we don't do it. You know, I, I, you talk with people who are facing a crisis and they're like, well, I got to check with the lawyer and I got to check with this, I got to check with that. Like, I got news for you. Social media is, is pounding you guys right now. If we don't get a response within the next hour, we have lost the golden hour of response to your crisis. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you need to move quickly and you need to accept the fact that there are times that communicating at the right, communicating at the right speed means going faster, just as there are times when it means going slower. You know, you brought up a great point there about social media and, you know, you, you're, you're comfortable. I think we talked about it here, understanding both social and traditional media, and there is a huge difference there. Okay. Uh, in social media, we have become a society that uh, is looking for instant gratification. I'm just as guilty. I mean, if I've got a problem with a uh, utility company or something like that, I'm on my Twitter account and I'm blasting them and I get a response within minutes. Yeah. And, and, and it's amazing to look at what's happened in that world, right? Where, mm -hmm. you know, so many things move so quickly, but here's an interesting story. And, and this not quite about social media, but, but our new technology in terms of communication. I was literally just talking about this with a company this morning. And, and that's the fact that the way we communicate has been changed by a lot of the new platforms that exist out there. And the one I, the example I point out is Amazon. Amazon is screwed up for companies all over. I, in fact, I've, I've talked specifically with lawyer groups about this because, you know, when, when, first off, you can do you order anything online. You order it, you instantly get a response saying, congratulations on your order. You get something and say it's being shipped. If it gets delayed, you get something and say it's being delayed. You get something that says it's coming to you today. You get another email or text that says it's 10 stops away. Then you get a picture of it on your front porch. And then you get another email that says, hey, how did we do? But here's the interesting thing. Right? You get all that people think communic Amazon communicates so well. Have you ever actually talked to no. Amazon? No. no one ever has, right? It's because Amazon is, I won't say no one, some people do, but the, the point is Amazon is so good at proactive communication that they don't need much reactive communication. They get ahead of the game, they let everybody know what's going to happen, they stay two steps ahead, and we all think Amazon communicates so well. Now, I will tell you, there was a time when I actually tried to get a hold of Amazon. I found it very frustrating. Now, yeah. they have some systems you can do it with, but ultimately, it's not as easy as, you know, as it is in the proactive side. Oh, no, it's, it's it, definitely not. And I had a situation like that. And it was something I had to call American. Don't you know that American Express helped me solve my problem with Amazon? Uh, I, I, I can tell you the American Express company has solved many problems for me over the years. And, and once again, they understand their model is different than Amazon. They're mm -hmm. built on that ability to fall, fall in. But, mm -hmm. but the point I make is proactive communication, communication versus reactive communication. If you're reacting, well, you're on the defensive. If you're proactive, that puts you in the driver's seat and other people going, okay, well, he's told me this. Now I need to figure out what to do. Mm-hmm. It goes back to the great Zig Ziglar used to always talk about the difference between reacting to a situation or responding to a situation. React is always more negative. Respond is more positive. Yeah. It, 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 and, but these days, because of Amazon, mm -hmm. you need to be ahead proactive. of what happens. Yeah, you're not reacting, you're proacting. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And that's so key. So 
tell us a, a great news story as we get ready to wrap up here. Something that happened in your 30 some years, um, a blunder either on your part or somebody else's part, something kind of fun. So let's go back to that, that concept of you're only as good as your last communication. So one day I'm a young rookie reporter. I'm down at the police station and I'm doing a, what we call a live shot where I'm standing at the police station. And I've got my microphone in my hand. And it was a big story about a detective who was, that were having an investigation because somebody had been shot and, you know, had the detective done something wrong. You know, we had, I, I had one TV station to my right, one TV station to my left. We're all doing live shots. I did the live shot at five at noon that day saying, well, still no word on the fate of this detective. Did the same live shot at six o'clock that, or five o'clock that day saying still no word on the fate of this detective. Six o'clock came around. I'm standing there with my microphone. Photographer cues me. And I looked at the camera and I said, still no, on, no word on the fate of detective. And I forgot his name. And I just stared into the camera and, and maybe it was five, 10 seconds, but you think about it, just stop for a moment and count to five or 10 seconds out loud and think about somebody on TV. And the funny thing is one of my good friends was a TV reporter right next to me. And he said, I really wanted to yell out the guy's name, but I just thought it would sound bad. Finally, I blurted out the guy's name. I finished the live report, fumbled my way through it, of course, because I didn't do very well because I was so bothered by it. I go back to the TV station. And it's, you know, by then most of the people have left and there on my typewriter, that's how long ago it was, there is a note. And it was a note from my boss, what we call the news director in the newsroom. And, and it was a fairly short note. And it's, it, was, it was, from a communication standpoint, brilliant. It said, there we've seen it, your worst moment in television, it will get better from here. And what that said to me was, he was watching, as a manager, he was doing his job. He was watching. It was bad. <laughs> we, we couldn't ignore that. We had to acknowledge that, right? But he left me thinking, you know what? You'll be okay. We'll get past this. As an employee, that little bit of communication was spectacular. And I'll tell you what, that happened easily 30 some odd years ago. I still have that memo, that, that note that he left on my typewriter to this day because it was, it was so brilliant. And, and it made me feel good about myself that things were going to improve. And I like to think that I did improve after that. At the very least, I stayed employed. Well, and that's it. I mean, that, that's so key. We, we're so wrapped up in productivity that we're forgetting the humility and the humanity in the business, regardless of what your business is. We exactly. work with people every single day. And we are working, whether it's in the news media, whether it's in radio, television, doesn't matter, whether we're in an assembly line plant, we are still working with people. And we need to be able to work together and show that sense of humility and humanity right there. Just, I mean, I was really fortunate. You know, I mean, I got to interview presidents, rock stars, all kinds of people over the years. Mm -hmm. And, and ultimately what you learn is, guess what? It's, they're all people, you just have to ask them questions. And most importantly, you have to listen to what they're saying so that when they respond, you can build off of that and you can, you can communicate. Remember, it's circular. It's you circular. say something, I listen, I respond. And once we've done that process, then we're communicating. Mm -hmm. It's not about saying something. No, it goes back and forth. You can listen to uh, Rick do his uh, Barrett Jackson stories too. Um, you got one of those coming up in a couple of weeks, I think. And yeah, we do. In fact, we're going to be in Scottsdale. And one of the things I love to do is tell stories about the cars. You know, who owned it? How did it become? How, who, who was the original designer on the Ford Mustang or whatever it may be? Mm -hmm. Telling stories, once again, you know, it's my motto. You know, words motivate people, but stories inspire them. It's those stories that help people connect to what you're saying. Absolutely. Well, I appreciate your time here today. Uh, I know it's a busy schedule for you. You've got a lot going on. And uh, I thank you for your time joining us on the Teamwork Advantage. Until next week, just remember that having a good day is just being average. When you listen to the Teamwork Advantage, we already know you're not average. So go make today an excellent and exceptional day. Thanks again, Rick. Make it an excellent day. Bye-bye. It was a pleasure. Thank you. You've been listening to the Teamwork Advantage with Greg Gregory. Be sure to like, subscribe, and activate the bell icon to be notified of future episodes. To learn more about how Greg can help your organization develop a powerful winning culture, visit TeamsRock.com. That's TeamsRock.com.